morning. Today's reading is found in Psalm 119, 49 through 56. Remember your word to your servant, in which you have made me hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, that your promise gives me life. The insolent utterly deride me, but I do not turn away from your law. When I think of your rules from of old, I take comfort, O Lord. How indignation seizes me because of the wicked who forsake your law. Your statutes have been my songs in the house of my sojourning. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and keep your law. This blessing has fallen to me that I have kept your precepts. This is God's word. And you may be seated. Father in heaven, we do thank you. Oh Lord, we thank you. Your gifts are so much greater and, and in our present, in our lives, more than perhaps we even know. But Father, in this moment, God, with perhaps a hundred different things running across each mind in this place, from the past week, the coming week, God, of what's happening this afternoon, of what happened this morning, God. Holy Spirit, help our minds and our hearts be present in this moment because this is such a gift. To be in this place with brothers and sisters. To not be alone in this world. God, often many people throughout the word, world refer to their, their team or their workplace or their friend group as a family, but nowhere is that actually true, more true than with the people of God. We are brothers and sisters in Christ because we're children of God. What a blessing. God, in whatever way you, you want to speak, Lord, I pray for obedience in my heart and my mouth. Lord, for a clarity of mind and a conviction of speech, Lord. We love you. Teach us great things that we need to know. Lord, unfold the eternality of the word to us this morning that we may be obedient in the week to come. God, we love you in Jesus' name. And church together said, Amen. Amen. Well, if you will, you grab your Bibles and turn to Psalm 119, starting in verse 49. That was the scripture that was read this morning. Now, in this series on Psalm 119, the largest psalm, perhaps the most well-crafted portion of scripture in the whole of it, arguably, this is all about meditating on and learning from God's Word. And as such, I, I, don't, I do feel compelled to ask, how are you doing in that? On the, on the subject of, of reading, meditating on, learning, and living out God's Word, how are you, how are you doing? How are we doing? Now, I want to I be very clear and pastoral this morning. My intention is never to to pressure or to shame, saying like, oh, you're not keeping up with your Bible reading. I mean, no, that's not my intention at all. But I don't think it's inappropriate to challenge us here. Amen. We're the people of God. We're, we're uh, as David Mathis would put it, the church is a, a being of the word, like an organism of the word. Our life comes from the word. There is an important distinction I want to make, though, between pressure and conviction. You know, people will say, like, I was hurt by the church because they pressured me and they shamed me. But, but, you know, maybe that's true, maybe that's not, because there's this other thing that's actually from God, and it's good. It's called conviction. When you feel that conviction in your heart, I should be doing something, but I'm not. That's a good thing. Because it keeps us from complacency. It, it keeps us from indifference. It keeps us from saying, oh, it's not important. When our spirit is saying, oh, it is important. And I, as pastor, would be remiss if I did not challenge us and check in. 
how are we doing with reading our Bibles, with reading the letter of God? And for those of us who are struggling with meeting with God in the word, because that's really what it is. It's meeting with a person through his written word. My question for explanation, exploration today, and for us all, really, is why is that? Why do we struggle? Why, why is it, you know, with the task of reading through the Bible in a year, which is kind of what we posed for us as a church, I posed for us as a church, challenged us, why is it such a daunting thing, so much so that we just, you know, we can't do it, we struggle with it? There was a 2023 statistical study that revealed of... Um, I'm going to say of all of Americans, 38%, 38% of Americans make resolutions each year, right? New Year's resolutions, you make a goal, you want to fulfill it. 38%, so about a third, a little over a third of Americans make a resolution. And of that pool, of that 38%, 80% of those resolutions are forgotten by February. So if you made a resolution here, uh, what is that, 80%, most of you have forgotten it. Already, I don't really think I actually made one, but if I forgot it, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. But of that 38% pool of the, of the adults, 46% of adults actually stick, for, stick with their resolution for another six months. But in the end, only 9% of all resolutions made in the year are actually kept to the end. And that doesn't speak to what happens then after that, the next year. Why is that? One of 10 people will actually keep the goal that they set out to do. Why? Why? I believe it comes down to misaimed expectations, right? You set this giant goal before you, and all you're just trying to do is just trying to meet that goal. You're not thinking of just the little baby steps to get there. Like, what do I have to do? You're trying to jump from point A to point B without going from, okay, what's step one? What's step two? What's step two? And then we'll get to the end. And just to take in the, the need and the failure to take into account that life is hard. Life happens. You have a goal, but then this gets in the way and this time constraint. And then this person needs you. And then, and then you know, you're tired by the end of it all. And then you just can't do it. I think this even is relatable to the fact, to the devotion to scripture. And even more so. If as followers of Jesus, if, if being in the word is that important, even more so we're going to experience the friction of life's hardships. And not just earthly hardships, of the spiritual realm as well. But we have this misaim expectations. We have this goal before us of reading the whole Bible in a year, and it's almost too daunting to even start. How do we do this thing? And how do we do it in such a way where it doesn't just like, okay, we're just checking off the list and I'm just doing my ba daily Bible reading, but it becomes my lifestyle. As the, as the psalmist would say, it's my life. It's just, it's just who I am. I, I'm just, I need your word. I derive life from the word. What, what's our solution? How do we get there? How do we become people of the word? And I believe that the reality and truth of the Bible, of its eternality, and the implications thereof have a lot to teach us upon this subject. But I want to first speak to, the, to life in the transient. From our scripture this morning, life in the transient, that means the temporary, that means the here and now. Life in this world, what's it like? Well, first of all, transitioning from the previous stanza, the, the, the psalmist presents a shiny model of devotion to Scripture, right? He says, like, I trust in your word. I hope in your rules. I seek them daily. I delight. I love them. That's a beautiful picture. And then it seems like in the next stanza, he kind of comes back down to earth and says, but this is reality of my life. This is reality of life in this world in which we're trying to keep that devotion. So we can, we can, we can make a big picture out of it and, and, and beautify it, but... The reality is, here's, here's what my life's like. Starting in verse 50, actually. The, the, the letter here is Zayin. Zayin. This is my comfort in my affliction. Let's just stop right there. My affliction. This is the first indicator he gives of life in the transient. This, this word affliction is ani. It's a very common word throughout the, the Old Testament in Hebrew of the 
of poorness, of suffering, of misery that just goes along with life in this world. He's going to use it a couple more times in verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Verse 71. It was good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. Verse 75. I know, O Lord, that your rules are righteous and in faithfulness you have afflicted me. 107. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your promise. And there's a few more times where he uses that word ani, and it's, he just, this is just along with my life is this reality of affliction. In the New Testament, Acts chapter 20, verse 23, remember Paul said, you know, I'm going to Jerusalem not knowing what happens to me there, but except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me that in every city, imprisonment and afflictions await me. The Holy Spirit is giving me a heads up, telling me that it doesn't matter where I go. Afflictions are there waiting for me. In, first, in uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 4, Paul writes, Therefore we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. So yeah, you are faithful and steadfast in following the Lord, even in the midst of your affliction, suffering, misery. This should at, not at all surprise us, right? Genesis 3, verse 17, after the first human sinned, God says to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I command you. I, I invite you to go back and actually read the context. It's not because he listened to the voice of his wife. Husbands, listen to your wife. And have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you. You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. And here's the, here's the point. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Long story short, because of sin, pain entered the world. Because of sin, suffering is now our experience. Affliction goes along with being alive. It's a, it's, a, it's a package deal. These are to be expected. So we ought not be surprised, church. Suffering is as old as sin. Right? We have to understand that because as we know, we can be so deceived... That being Jesus followers of an almighty, good, and loving God automatically means I'll never go through anything hard. Why can't we do that? Because when we do go through something hard, who's the first person we're going to blame? It's God. Because God, you were supposed to never let me experience pain or suffering or hardship. No, no, no. Because then that keeps us from being able to depend upon him. It keeps us from the truth that maybe he's allowed us to happen so that he can bring a better good through it and we can cling to him and hope in him and see even a better result in our life even because of suffering see suffering is as old as sin though god what the enemy meant for evil god always means for good but our affliction understand that number one it's a package deal affliction goes with being alive secondly 51 verse 51 the insolent utterly deride me. So let's look at that. The insolent. We've seen this in verse 21. You rebuke the insolent accursed ones who wander from your commandments. This word insolent means proud, the arrogant, the scoffers, those who say, you know, Christianity, religion, that's for the weak, right? You know, Christians, they, I mean, they, they, they don't have it all figured out, but we do, right? They're just... Stuck in their old book. He uses a few more times. Um, looking at Psalm 42, actually, verse 3. Do I have that one? I can turn back to it. Because it's in the same book. That's why I didn't put it up there. Verse 42, verse 3. These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God. Oh, wait, that was verse 4. Sorry. My tears have been my food night and day, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? That's, that's characteristic of the insolent. Where is your God that you so hope in? With such a, a demeaning tone, a deriding, he says. That's, that's like mocking and scoffing. 
In Psalm 123, 123 verse 4, our soul has had more than enough of the scorn of those who are at ease and the contempt of the proud. But Paul, he gives us a heads up even in the New Testament. In Romans chapter 1, verse 28. Alex, come on. Why didn't I put that there? Romans chapter 1, listen to this. Verse 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, he's speaking to those who reject God, of which we all once were, he gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. Hey, children in here. Foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Man, that, that is what we're up against, church. And I would remind us to look out for those characteristics in ourselves. First Timothy, uh, verse 1, 3. Paul speaks of himself. I was formerly a blasphemer, persecutor, insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I acted in unbelief. Insolence. This proud, arrogant attack of the followers of Jesus. See, sin has caused suffering and so it is for insolence. See, as long as sin has its dominion, what does sin do? It, it, it corrupts and it perverts, it infects the mind, heart, soul, and even body. And so as long as sin has this dominion, as, Romans, as Paul says in Romans, has this dominion in our lives, there will always be those who deride, who mock, who scoff at Christians because they think, this is the mindset, we talked about this a little bit at Sunday school, they think Christians are bigoted, prudes, unjust, even evil for what we stand for, which, which we understand, as we talk about in Sunday school, is the best, the good design and will, almighty, all-loving, all-governing God. So when people think that Christians are something that is really just a lie, who told them that, Right? That's what I was thinking as I was thinking about it. Who told those people who think Christians are bigoted that we're bigoted, right? We see, if they've, if they've had an encounter with a bigoted Christian, then they, they haven't had an encounter with an actual Christian, I'd say. Who told them that? Sin has a way of corrupting our view of others, people. And it keeps us from that. But what, what needs to happen is, okay, what is done in response to that? But I'm getting myself getting ahead of myself. But the insolent, we understand this in our world more than ever in America. There are so many people just attacking Christianity. Now, what do we do against that? Or in response to that? Well, number three, hot indignation. Verse 53, look at verse 53. Hot indignation seizes me because of the wicked. Hot indignation. This word hot indignation is a word to mean raging heat. It comes from a root word meaning to boil, right? Think of it like a, like a furnace in your chest. Any of you got Irish or Scottish blood in you and you just feel that furnace in your chest when something, you know, gets against you? Kind of uh, what we talked a little bit about at men's group, how there, there can be this passion within us for injustice. That's good. A righteous anger that arises within us. Why? Because of the wicked who forsake your law. Who forsake the good, beautiful, perfect design of God for human flourishing. This word wicked means the guilty. We could say it means unbelievers. You, know, you could probably make it, you know, apply it also to those who know the truth but don't follow the truth. But essentially, it's those who are sinning unrepentantly. That could go for believers, unbelievers. There could be this unrepentant, unconfession of sin. And this is a passion of righteous indignation that's good. There, there's, it shows that we're not to be indifferent to matters which offend God. God is offended by sin. 
He's offended by wickedness. He's offended by injustice. That's why we talk. That's why the Bible talks about the wrath of God. There is stuff that's happening in the world that God cannot tolerate. And the more we have God's heart, we should sort of feel that, no, that's not right. But I want us to understand that though that passion should drive us to action, we ask the question, okay, what is that action? Because the psalmist didn't say anything about his action yet. He just says, this is what I'm just feeling toward wickedness in the world. But it's how we act upon that passion that makes or breaks because many Christians and churches, they get this uh, title of bigoted and unjust because of the way they've stood up for what's right in the wrong way. But here's just the reality of what we feel. There are those who offend God unrepentantly. We understand. Maybe they don't even see it that way. Maybe they say that they're sticking up for something good. But as we read the truth, we understand, no, 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 that, that's not the way of God. That's not the way of Jesus. Perhaps you feel a righteous, hot indignation and boil in your chest to get seeing all that's happening in the world. That's something we just have to reckon with, right? That's something we have to deal with in our hearts. It's something we experience, but we need to understand what do we, how do we act upon that experience. And I'm just talking, I'm just setting the stage here. Life in the transient, right? Afflictions, insolent, the wicked, this indignation we feel. But it's the last one that's probably the most important. And I'm going to look at this. Uh, verse 54. Your statutes have been my songs in the house of my sojourning. In the house of of my sojourning. And then the first line of the next verse, I remember your name in the night. In the night. I just sung about that in, in the garden, right? The night around me has fallen. Very simply, these two descriptions, in the house of my pilgrimage, my sojourning, my wandering in this foreign land, this is just describing for us the present state of our life. In this world, we know this. We talked about this. Verse 19, I am a sojourner on earth. Hide not your commandments from me. The Apostle Paul speaks to this in 1 Thessalonians 5. For you are all children of the light, children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of the darkness. So then it's not, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. This is kind of this experience here. That we're citizens of another country and we're not at home in this land though we live here. And we're people of the light amongst people who live in darkness. We're like uh, Israel in the land of Goshen while Egypt was shrouded with darkness. We're watching people stumble in the darkness. We're watching people uh, stay in their sin. We're watching the world just blind to what is very clear to us who have the scriptures. And building upon what we know so far, why is the previous verses, affliction, insolent, indignation because of the wicked, why is that our experience? Well, it's precisely because we're citizens of, a, of another country living in a place that's not our home. We're in the light amongst people who are just fumbling around in the darkness we just experience this affliction in hostile territory. So this is life as to be expected in here and now. Welcome. Welcome to planet Earth. Right? Welcome to life. Does, this, does having this expectation and this understanding of life make it any easier? No. Does it make it hurt less? Does it make it less frustrating? No. No. So what's the advantage, right? What's the advantage of knowing what we're up against? Well, it's having this realistic and illuminated perspective that gives us the proper posture of neediness. We talked about that. We're needy. We're people in need and on, independent upon another so if, we, if we didn't have this perspective, we wouldn't see our need to, okay, I need help in this life. Right? I, I need comfort amidst my affliction. I, I need confidence in the face of insolentness. I need peace and love in the midst of a world that causes rage in my heart because of injustices. 
I need a map in my pilgrimage. I need a torch in my night. See, suffering is as old as sin, but I guess, I don't guess, we all know there's someone older than that, right? That people's words may hurt us, but there is someone whose words can heal us. Wickedness may seem rampant in the land, but God is in control of it all. This is the thing. In the midst of this life in the transient, there is one who is in control and with us in the midst of it. So that's what I want to talk about next is life from eternity. Life from eternity. See, amidst the experiences of the present moment in our day, the psalmist points to his hope and stay. And it's ours as well. So looking at this, verse 49, going back up. I'm kind of jumping around so you can follow me. Remember your word to your servant in which you have made me hope. In which you have made your word, you have made me hope in your word. We saw this last week. This word hope means waiting with expectancy. It means waiting with the understanding that it's going to be fulfilled. What God has spoken will not return to him void. He will accomplish all that he purposes. And understand, in which you have made me hope. It's a common theme here in Psalm 119. God made it happen. Why? Because how are we supposed to have hope in a hopeless world? How are we supposed to see in the night? Somebody's got to come in. Help us. Grab our hand and help us out of the darkness, out of the pit. Give us assurance it's all going to be okay. And it's in his word. That's what we're talking about this morning. That's what Psalm 19 is about. I, I don't feel the need to kind of repeat that it's about his word. We're hoping in his word. But secondly, in verse 50, this is my comfort in my affliction. My comfort in my affliction. That your promise gives me life. This word comfort is used again in verse 52. When I think of your rules from of old, I take comfort. The root, we, root word here for comfort is nachem. Nachem. It's part of Nehemiah's name, Nehemiah. Right? The root word means to breathe strongly. Right? When a doctor puts a thing up to your chest and says, take a deep breath. That's nachem. Nachem. I understand this very well, right? That when you're anxious, when you're scared, when you're angry, what happens to your breath? And it just makes it worse, right? Because you need a deep breath to help regulate your body. And until you take a deep breath, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. In the midst of my affliction, it causes my breath to feel like I'm breathing through a straw and there's a weight on my chest. Here's God's word coming in his promises to give me life. Your promise gives me life. Literally, we could say this. This is what enables me to breathe, God, your word. Genesis 2, 7. He breathed into the man's nostrils the breath of life and he became a living being. The same is true of his word. It is like being breathed into our nostrils every day we get of it. The word give me life literally means to revive, right? This world that knocks me down and makes me feel like I'm dead brings me up. It's like Jonah and the fish, right? The word comes to him again and brings him back out. This is the word which revives us daily. Enables us to breathe. And your statutes have been my songs, verse 54. My songs. So you remember Psalm 19 itself is a song. And so many psalms within the whole Psalter, that's what we call it the Psalter when referring to the whole book. Some of the songs there in Psalms, they record the lowest of emotions. But they're songs, right? I uh, yeah, often think of uh, Psalm 88, which ends, literally, the, the song ends My companions have become darkness. My, my friends are darkness. That's it. That's the end of the song. Yet it's in the 
book of the, it's in the Bible saying this, this is something you can plead to God in song. Why? Songs just have a way which God has designed us to get to the root of our emotions, of what we're feeling and what we're going through. I was just laughing about this yesterday, and uh, we went to a basketball game, and the, the pep band that was playing, you know, playing some you know well-known songs. But anyway, and many of you. Have, have, have had children understand this. I mean, he was just dancing, you know. JJ was dancing uh, to the song. And I was like, okay, oh, nobody ever taught him to dance, right? No, he doesn't know what dance is. It's just his physiological response to what he's hearing. There's something to the core of our being that just what songs just appeal to us in ways in which are spiritual, are miraculous, are divine. Here's a way in which The word of God is like getting to the root of who we are, trying to help us sing a new song. Your statutes have become my songs. They help me through what I'm going through. Amen. Verse 56, last one in this, this section. This blessing has fallen to me. This blessing. It's kind of a similar language as verse 50. This is my comfort and my affliction that your promise gives me life. Verse 56, this blessing has fallen to me that I have kept your precepts. In the midst of this, actually the the language here is literally as the NASB puts it, New American Standard says, this has become mine, right? This has become my possession. This has become, and the implication is that if God is the one making it happen, right? This blessing has come down to me. This gift has come to me that I've been enabled to be obedient in the midst of this life. It's by implication is saying God made it happen. God made it happen. And if obedience is by the, is by the empowering and the sanctification of the Holy Spirit, it is therefore a blessing from God coming down from the Father of lights. So this experience Hope, comfort, revival, song, blessing, life from eternity, from his word. What does this teach us? I think the psalmist is expressing the same experience of Paul, 2 Corinthians verse 4. So we do not lose heart. Amen, church? I'll say it again for the people in the back so you can wake up. (laughs) So we do not lose heart. So our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed, revived, given life day by day. Four, because this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen, the things that are seen are transient. But the things that we that are unseen are eternal life from eternity every day amidst what can often feel like unrelenting and often unreasonable an unreasonable string of life draining experiences in your life. Sometimes often literally people amongst us here right now. I know people who are not with us literally physical sickness has been draining your life. The man of God is sharing the unrelenting, unfathomable spring of eternal life available to those who will just come and drink. There is something available for us. Something that the world does not have access to until they find the access point of Jesus Christ. So we, we present that gospel to them. Now, now, it's not just that one moment of eternal life. It is a constant daily availability to come to Jesus, come and drink from the springs of life. But how can this be true? We, by implication, we say that that being renewed day by day is by taking up our cross daily, being in his word. Why is that true? What is it about the quality of the word which makes it a fountain of spiritual life? And looking at the one thing I haven't really focused on yet, verse 52, right in the middle, when I think of your rules from of old, I don't know why I did that. From of old, past. Past. And not just that it's an old book, right? This word means ancient, from ages, from the far past. We're not just talking about the fact that it's an old book. 
but the fact that it's an eternal book. Yes, it's an old book. Why? Because it was spoken in eternity. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Often quoted this one. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction now, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Remember your word to your servant in which you have made me hope. Uh, chapter 16, 25 and 26 of Romans. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. In 1 Corinthians 2, we would have read this recently this past week. Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom. Although it's not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom which, of God which God decreed before ages for our glory. The eternality of Scripture. Why is that so important to understand? Because the potency, meaning the power of Scripture, is in its eternity. That the relevancy of Scripture now is because of its eternality. If that the immutability of Scripture, that means it's, it does not change, and it doesn't need to change, is because it was spoken in eternity. Because God spoke in eternity past, right? Not in time, but in eternity there is therefore now no time into which his word does not speak. I mean, he has spoken in eternity. There is nothing that you and I are going to go through that his word cannot speak life into. That his word is not the ultimate life-giving resource to us. See, the word is old, but it's not the writings of dead people. It is the revelation of a living God. Because God is eternal. Everything he speaks has predetermined your hope and stay in life, song, and blessing every day. Every day. Uh, a famous uh, con uh, confession of faith says that the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down or necessarily contained in Holy Scripture, unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelation of the Spirit or traditions of men. What's he saying? He's saying everything you need to know is right here. And because it's spoken in eternity, nothing needs to be added to it. Nothing needs to be changed because an eternal perfect God has set down his will. Thomas Aquinas says, uh, a really old church father says, things reduced to act in time as known by us successively in time, but by God are known in eternity, which is above time. Whence to us they cannot be certain for as much as we know future contingent things on such, but they are certain to God alone whose understanding is in eternity above time. Now, I know that was kind of probably over your head, but what's he saying? He's saying we only can know what we know and anticipate what we can anticipate in time. But since God is outside of time, right? Meaning he didn't have a starting point. He doesn't have an end point. He's in eternity time past. He's in eternity forward. He's here present with us right now. Because of his eternal nature, that's how the word of God contains an eternal nature too. And therefore can speak into time and into your situation in ways which you and I can't prepare for. We can't understand how to do. But his word is that resource for us. But the last question I have for us is, how do we access that life from eternity? How do we access that? Okay, understand that it, here, here's my life in the transient. Here's what's available to me from eternity. How do I access that life from eternity? How do I unlock the renewing power of the word? Jesus taught in a parable, Matthew 13, verse 52. And he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house 
who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. I want to speak to you about how to bring out that treasure. First got to store up that treasure. So there's three, a repetition of three words here, and, and this, is, this is where we're going to end. Verse 49, remember to your word to your servant. Verse 52, when I think of your rules from of old. That word think is the same word as remember in the Hebrew. Verse 55, I remember your name in the night, O Lord. This word is zakar. It means to call to mind or to name, to, to, to point to, to remember. And the first is this. The first is his prayer in verse 49. He prays that God would help him to remember. Help me to remember. Right? Isn't that such a gift, church? That we can pray in the midst of what we're going through. Help me remember what's true. Help me remember your promise. Help me remember what you have declared is mine and my victory. Help me. This is what we can pray. So that's, that's a number one. Uh, him praying for God's help to remember. Verse 52 is essentially when I think of your rules from of, from of old. He, he's referring to himself and how he recalls those things. I am thinking, I, I am remembering what you have said. But not just what he has said, what he has done. Verse 55, I remember your name in the night, O Lord, or O Yahweh. Now the name, what does this mean? Your name, Yahweh. It's the person and characteristics of Yahweh, the one true creator, God. This word uh, name, or remember, I mean, remember is used 232 times in the Old Testament and largely is referring in the Torah and the first five books of the Bible to is commanding Israel to remember God's works, what God has done. And on Wednesday night, we looked at John chapter 2, verse 17. His disciples then remembered what was written. Zeal for your house will consume me. Jude 17 through 21 says, But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they said to you in the last time there will come scoffers, following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. But you... Beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to glory. That, that whole, look, you remember what was said? And here's what you need to do in response to that. That, that. He is saying that's in response to remembering what the Lord Jesus said through his apostles. Remembering. Now, remembering implies a past event, right? Right? We know that. A past event, a past experience to be able to call to mind. For the psalmist, it was remembering the history of God's saving of Israel. And therefore, his name, saying your name, it reminds me of what you have done. And his name also, it implies, it highlights this, his own personal and intimate knowledge of who Yahweh is. Right? I remember your name. I'm remembering who you are, what you have done. And declaring God's word from eternity, remembering it, is our assurance that it won't change. Or our declaring that it is from eternity is our assurance that it won't change. Therefore, that is how we can remember it and experience this life from eternity. To kind of draw them close, we understand that to be ready and confidently ready for a test, one has to study, right? To be prepared for the big game, one has to practice the memorized plays. An experienced chef doesn't really necessarily need to look at a recipe. And for us, eternity is accessed by the prior work of immersing ourselves daily in the scriptures. We're ready now. We're prepared. We're built up in our most holy faith. We can go into this life in the transient 
ready for whatever comes our way. Do any of you ever remember those little, I don't even know what they're called, I call them tablets here, where you take those things and put them in a little bowl of water and then they would expand and become like a washcloth or something? Anybody remember those? Yeah. It's the experience of being immersed in that water than then the tablet, the, what is really a towel, can then reach its full potential. And you and I will never experience that fullness of life and potential without being immersed in the Word, in the Word that is our water, that is the, it is the access point to eternity. It is that door in which we walk into heaven every day in renewed life. But not just the Word examined, not just immersing ourselves in the Word, but there is the Word experienced as we mark the truth of God's will being worked out in our lives. His name is, is inextricably linked to his acts, what he does, that, he, that express who he is. How do we know who he is? By what he's done. How do we know he's gracious? By his gracious acts. How do we know he's loving? By his loving acts. How do we know he is just and wrathful? By his judgments. We know who he is by what he's done. And so we take inventory by marking his acts that are told, us of his, told up to us in his word. And we see them lived out in our life when we take inventory of our story to present. You look back on your life. I guarantee you, you mark point and point again where you see, yes, God was faithful. God was trustworthy. God spoke truth to me. God was gracious to me. God saved me from the pit. Now, everything we read about in the wor Word didn't just happen then. It's happening now in your life, in my life, in this church, in this world, if we just open up our eyes to see it. And what taking inventory of our story does is it's filling the well. It's filling the well. Going back to another school analogy, I always loved when the, when the teacher would say, hey, you can take a three by five card, whatever notes you can fit on that, you can take with you to the test, right? Filling the well is taking the truth with us to the test, right? You, you don't have to be wondering in the moment, okay, what's true, what's, what's true? No, filling our well with the word is allowing us the, the, the truth to be brought into the moment. But in case, in case we haven't done that prior work, Jesus said, look, the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the counselor who will come to you, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. Right? So what that means is that we're not just relying on our own strength and ability and remembrance because some of us, like myself, can't remember things that well. But it's not just our mind. When we read this past week, we have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2. Right? We have the Holy Spirit. Always remember, you have the Holy Spirit, church. It's not just you walking around up there. It's God himself walking as you go throughout this world. And in the midst of your situation, when you can't remember, you cry out, remember to your servant, oh God, what you have said. Because I can't remember right now. In the midst of this, I just can't see you right now. The reality is that although we won't remember... You sit down every day, ideally, with your word, with, with your copy of the scriptures, and you're reading, what, two a day, two scriptures a day personally, two with your family. You're not going to remember everything that you read every morning, right? You're not going to come away every day with some mind-blowing, earth-shattering truth that just transforms your life in a second. No. So what's the point? Is it worth it still? Yes, it is. Because the true fruition of obedience to getting in the word is what becomes of our well over 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, 50, 60 years of daily Bible reading. It's not about just getting it all in in one swell, but about that step by step by step. Don't look at, I need to read the whole Bible, right? Or, you know. That progressive work of God filling your well through mere obedience to getting in the word. It is 
eternally better than never being in the world. You may not get it all. You may not understand it all. You may not understand the point of why am I reading Leviticus? You know, why am I reading this? It doesn't really apply to me right now. But that's filling your well. And there's going to be a point in which you come to something that is a Job-like experience. And thank God you read Job because you have a perspective now. How God was already preparing you when you read that five years ago. How uh, I, I mean, I don't. I can't relate to this. I'm not married, or I can't uh, re- relate to this. I'm not. At the, I'm not a. I'm not in ministry, right? How am I supposed to relate to this? Well, it's not always about you and me. It's about how that's filling our well, so we can bring out a bucket for somebody else who's needing it. You may, you and I may feel limited. May not feel like we can make it to the end. But let us never underestimate that infectious, powerful word that we're getting into every day. Father in heaven, thank you for another day. Thank you for your word and its eternal nature speaking into our time with as much potency and relevance as when you first spoke it. Because you are eternal. You are never taken off guard by anything. So you're always already ready. Thank you so much for this church and our desire to get in the word. I pray that each and every one of us, including myself, receive a fresh wind of grace, a double portion of your spirit, anointing this week for a hunger and a thirst for your word. Not just to read it, to meet with you, to encounter the living God. Father, thank you so much. Grant us a holy discontent till we get with you or fill with your will. Father, we pray that in our moments of feeling lost in the house of our sojourning, of feeling low in the night. God, that you would prompt us again to cry out, remember to us. Help us remember what you said. Because all I can hear is lies. All I can hear is accusation. All I can hear is attack. Sometimes that's all we can hear. God, I pray for a confession of sin in which we have paid more attention to the newspaper, to the news channels, to social media outputs more than your word. We confess our sin. And we ask that you cleanse us and renew our hearts for eternal truth and good news. God, I pray for anyone in this room that does not has never heard that good news before. At least it's never sat true in their hearts that although we are great sinners, you are a great Savior, Jesus Christ. Though we have messed up a thousand times, your one act of obedience has saved every single one of us who will believe. We pray for I pray for anyone in this room who is under that category. They never put their faith in you. As heads are bowed, eyes are closed, if that's you in this room, I'm not going to ask you to come forward, I'm not going to ask you to raise a hand, but don't leave this place without doing business with God. What is your life? It is but a mist. Here one day and gone the next. We don't know our time. Today is the day of salvation. Today, right now, is the time to put your faith in Jesus. Ask me, please save me. By grace through faith, you will be saved forever. Holy Spirit, remind us that you are with us this week. Every moment we wake up, help us remember that you are you are our present comforter, counselor, and powerful sanctifier. 
every moment of every day. Help us to listen to you in moments when we're prompted to pray for somebody or just uh, have an open conversation with somebody about, about what we believe or what they believe. Help us be a church that is missional, that our missionaries here in this place, in our location, All right, God, we thank you and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you stand with me for a closing benediction? All right. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Bless somebody on your way out.